The words went out, exalted in Greek, cannot mean that he went out of the upper room. They had left there some time ago. It can only mean that now they went out of Jerusalem itself on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. There is no real problem here. As Craig Blomberg points out, peripatetic rabbis and philosophers regularly taught and discoursed with their followers as they walked. There is no reason why John needs to say specifically that the group left after 1431. I think that's obvious. The last discourse, therefore, is a unity. In terms of the historical situation, its purpose is very clear. Let me say first what it is not. The last discourse is not an exposition of the Christian life. True, we can learn a great deal about the Christian life from this discourse. But this benefit is not the reason for the discourse. Plainly, the last discourse was designed to prepare the disciples for the events that lay immediately ahead. In other words, it was designed to prepare them for Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and return to heaven. If we pay attention to the text, this purpose has high visibility and it is inescapable. Permit me to list here a series of statements by Jesus that disclose this purpose beyond doubt. I'm going to quote a series of passages. John 13, 18 to 19. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes... But when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. 1333. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. 1336. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards. 14.1-4 Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. 14, 16, and verses 18 and 19. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. 1429. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. 1520b to 21. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things that they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. 161. These things have I spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. 16.4 But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you them. And these things I did not say to you from the beginning, because I was with you. 16.16 16. A little while, and you will see, not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. 1620, most assuredly I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. And you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. 1628, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. 1632, indeed the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. 
And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. 17, 4 to 5, speaking to the Father. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory I had with you before the world was. 1711a. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. 1713. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I rest my case. The historical purpose of the last discourse was this, to prepare the disciples for the events that would begin that very night and would lead to the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Part three. The literary purpose of the last discourse. Only if we see clearly the historical purpose of the last discourse are we prepared to see the literary purpose of this discourse in the fourth gospel. In an inspired document, we expect a literary purpose that is fully consistent with the historical purpose. As we have just said, the last discourse is not an exposition of the Christian life. It is certainly useful for Christian living, but this was not the historical purpose. What then is the literary purpose within the framework of John's Gospel? Part A, the audience of John's Gospel. Before we address the literary purpose of the fourth Gospel, we should ask about its audience. Who were they? Ancient tradition points in one direction only. According to Irenaeus, second century, John, the disciple of the Lord, who also leaned upon his breast, published a gospel during his stay at Ephesus. Eusebius, the fourth century church historian, reports the following, quote, Meanwhile, the holy apostles of our Savior were scattered across the world. Thomas, according to tradition, was allotted Parthia, Andrew, Scythia, and John, Asia, where he stayed until his death, end of quote. Later in his history, Eusebius quotes the statement of Irenaeus, to which I have just referred. Despite the many debates about this evidence, there is no good reason for rejecting it. Both writers are likely to have known more than we do. The internal evidence of the gospel is consistent with the view that the fundamental audience was Jewish and living outside of Palestine. It was also Greek-speaking and very literate. During the days now long past when Rudolf Bultmann was the towering figure in New Testament scholarship, it was popular to describe John as a piece of Hellenistic literature that was only marginally Jewish as compared with the Synoptic Gospels. This view now deserves to be laughed at. The Qumran discoveries not only indicate the fundamental Jewishness of John's Gospel, they also have led to the equally extreme suggestion that John is the most Jewish of all the Gospels. I pause to say this with tongue in cheek. It would be fun to write a soap opera about the many convolutions through which New Testament scholarship has passed. I've been around for seven decades. We could call it, as the scholarly world turns. <laughs> but despite the obvious uh, Jewish character of John's Gospel, John still translates certain Semitic words. For example, Rabbi, Messias, Kephas, Siloam, Golgotha. The audience could not be presumed to understand these Semitic words. Furthermore, the audience must necessarily have been quite literate. In Roman times, you did not write a 21-chapter book for the man in the street. 
perhaps I should say for the man in the marketplace, the agora. A long book of this nature presupposes a high educational level for its readers. Keep in mind that Greek-speaking Jews were a fruitful evangelistic field in New Testament times. The Hellenists referred to in Acts, Hellenistai, are best understood as Greek-speaking Jews. Their widows alone made up a significant portion of the Christian widows in the early church. As is often pointed out, the six deacons chosen to resolve the problem all had Greek names. Philippos, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolas. 